But friends, we've been in this series now for the last couple of weeks, right? This series called Soul Shift, where we've really been setting our eyes on this, this target, right? Of, of seeing God bring about these seven major shifts, these changes within our life uh, that can really allow us to walk in such a greater, more meaningful, more purposeful journey with him. Be people who don't just, ah, yeah, I believe in God, but to really step into what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And so we've been leaning into these seven major shifts in this series. And so far we've talked about two of them, right? A couple weeks ago, we talked about our first one, which was a shift from ask to listen. From being people who, who don't just casually ask others and listen to others and, and even to casually ask God. We don't just Google search God. What do you want me to do? Okay, I guess I'm not hearing from you, so I'm going to just keep going my own way. But be people who actually begin to listen to God. Listen to Him. Like to stop what we're doing and to wait and listen. And we wrestled with that moment in, in John chapter 10. Do you remember where Jesus shared that story of this parable of, of a shepherd with some sheep and how there are people who jump the fence, right? And they pretend to be sheep. But only the really ones who know his voice are ones that walk through the gate. How can be people who really walk through life with Christ, to be in Christ, that we can listen, we can know his voice. And then last week we talked through our second shift, the shift from me to you, the shift from not just living life about me, but living life about others. But living, living my life with purpose every day to love people well. And we especially broke down what that looks like to love people well when we're hurting. Because it's easy to love people well when we're feeling good, right? We got a cup of coffee. We got some joy, right? We're happy. We're excited, right? We walk into the office. Life is great. We don't mind smiling and, and encouraging people. But when, ah, when life is hard... When we wake up on the wrong side of the bed, when we're walking through some things that are really challenging, it's hard. It's hard to be a person of love. We typically, we tend to be short and snappy and mean and rude and, and considerate, all of these things. And we really leaned into what, is, what does it look like, right, for us to love people well when we feel unloved? How do, how do we care for people when we don't feel cared for? How, how do we, how we elevate others, right? How we pick them up when we're already at our lowest. And so last couple of weeks were some really some challenging things that we walked through. And, and if, if you missed it, or maybe you just want to listen to it again, I encourage you, listen, take advantage of, of, of these messages because they're all recorded. So you can find them on our church's YouTube channel, on Facebook. If you're a person like me and you love podcasts, all of our sermons are on every podcast station you can think of. And so whatever you use, our podcast channel is there. Just search our church name and you'll find it. But listen, God has been doing this work. And so now we're in our third shift this morning that we're going to press into. And, and listen, I, I don't want us to just casually walk through today because this morning is actually probably one of the most challenging shifts that we're going to talk about. It is probably the most difficult. Not because we're trying to construct something new, but actually because we're more or less trying to undo something. Tying our shoes, right? can be easy unless we're having trouble bending over to tie our shoes. <laughs> but when a knot gets stuck, it's a pain, right? You can yank at it, pull, but you can't go anywhere when you got a knot in your shoelaces. And this morning, there's a knot in our heart. Someone's been there. Maybe we don't even know it's there. That we need to, we need to talk through this morning, the shift that honestly is the door. It is, it is the, the key to much of these other shifts that we're going to talk through. And Jesus best begins to explain this shift in our journey with him in, in a story that maybe you've heard of before. It's, it's a parable that he, he told. He spent a lot of time telling it. He was actually in the company with a lot of different people. He was in the city of Jerusalem at this time, and, and he had his disciples, of course, with him. And he has some Pharisees, right? These religious leaders, these people who are looking in and looking for, uh, to kind of cast some judgment and to be criticizing and all these things and walking into that moment with a bitter heart. And, and there are also people there who are often seen as people who are hated by God. 
people like tax collectors, people who are sinners, people who, who write, who, oh, you are scum of this earth. You need to give it away. And then there's everyone else. There are people listening to God, listening to Jesus in this moment. As he shares this story, he shares a story of this really wealthy man, really wealthy man who, who had great influence in his community. He had, he, he had a, a, a great uh, image across the nation, uh, around his community. People knew him, respected him, and, and this man had built quite an empire. And, and you see, what's rather incredible is that he had two sons who everyone thought were going to take over the family business someday. These two sons who were, who were growing up underneath him, they'd spent their whole lives working in the family business. They spent their whole lives learning the trade. But then all of a sudden, one day, the younger son comes home from working. He says, you know what, Dad? I'm tired of this. I, I want my cut. I, I want what's owed to me. I want, I want my inheritance. And, and so he goes up to his dad and says, listen, I, I, want, I want what is owed me. I want my inheritance. You know, I, I kind of wish that you were dead. I kind of don't really care about you or our family or this, this business of ours. I just, I just want my money. I want what is mine. And to everyone's complete surprise, the father gave him his inheritance. And so the younger son, he, he left the house. He, he went out and with such great fortune, with such great wealth in his pockets, he began living out all of the fun that he had been wanting to for so many years. Imagine he's 18, he's left the nest, he's left the house, and for so many years he's been told, no, you can't do this, no, you can't do that. And now he's like, oh, finally I get to go party and do this, I get to be with some women, I get to go do these new things, I get to try all this stuff that I've been wanting to try for so long. But after months and months and months of doing all this stuff, he found himself alone and broken. When his pockets were empty, the women who he thought loved him left. His friends who he, he thought were friends, his buddies who he thought he could count on, walked away. He was left with nothing. He had tried everything. But he learned that the advertisements of the world don't really live up to how they're shown. That there are a lot of masks. And so he winds up with nothing. And so this younger son, he tries to figure out what he can do. And so he tries to put his, his life a little bit back together. So he gets a job at a local farm. We starts feeding some pigs. And, and he actually gets to a moment where he is at his lowest. He is miserable. He is angry at the world. He is just angry at himself. And he says, you know what? If I could just have some of the slop I'm feeding the pig, maybe I'll be happy. Maybe I'll be full. I'm so hungry and so low. That's where I'm at. And then all of a sudden he has this idea that maybe, that maybe I can go back home. Maybe I can go back home and, and maybe it's been a while. Maybe my dad is not as angry. And so he cleans himself up as much as he could and he goes home. And he steps on the property, he begins walking down the driveway, and, and he sees the house, right? He sees off in front of him as the, as the driveway goes up to the front porch. He, he sees his dad and a few of his staff there on the porch going through some business items. But then he sees his dad in his beautiful suit and all of, all of his wealth, all of his, his image, right? Look his way. And he's walking one foot down one foot after another, just kicking some rocks as he's walking down the driveway in shame. But to his complete surprise, his father leaps off the front porch, even though he's in some beautiful dress shoes, and runs through the mud. And he begins running out to him. And he's trying to think of the words to say, the son is. But as his father gets closer, he just decides to get on his, on his knees and he says, Dad, listen, I'm so sorry. Please forgive me. Listen, just hire me on as a servant. Listen, I, I, don't, I don't deserve to be called your son. I don't, be, I don't deserve to live in the house with you. I don't, I don't deserve any of what you had for me before. L listen, just please forgive me. I'll be a servant. Just put me at the very bottom of, of, of the list. And his father would hear none of it. He said he wrapped his arms around him. He gave him a big old hug, a big old bear hug, squeezing tight. And with tears rolling down his face, his dad turned around and yelled to his staff that's on the front porch and said, listen, I need you to bring some clothes. Come on, let's get some, get some things. Let's clean up my son. He's home. 
Let's throw a feast. Let's have a great big celebration. And he brings him into the house. And when Jesus reaches this point of the story, he looks around. He looks around at everybody who's listening. And they think the story's over. But then he continues to talk. And he says, you know, the night had come. The celebration was going on. Fireworks. Pew, pew, pew. Everybody was dancing. There was music. It was wonderful. There was ribs for miles. Oh. And the father noticed that his older son wasn't there. And so he goes out, out into the fields looking for him, trying to find where his older son is, and he finds him. He's making his way back. He says, where have you been? Your, your, your brother's home. And the older son looks to his dad and says, how, how can you be happy? How, how can you be happy that he's home? Don't you remember what he did? Don't you remember how he embarrassed our family? How he humiliated us? Don't you remember what he did to you? All the nights of you, you crying and weeping in, in your bedroom because he was gone. Don't you remember what he did? And I've been here this whole time. I've stand by your side. I, I have not walked away. I've picked up the slack that he let go. Where's my reward? And in complete shock, the dad looks at him and just says, my son, looks at him and says, my, my son, talking to him, that you're my son. Listen, your brother was home. We thought he was dead. But he's home and he's alive. And then Jesus stops telling the story. He doesn't finish it. We don't know what happens next. We don't know what the older brother does. But Jesus ends the story. And, and maybe as I told it, some memories came together. And remember, you remember this story. This is a story that Jesus tells in Luke chapter 15. It's this moment uh, that we later on call the parable of the prodigal son or the lost son. And it's this rich story that Jesus tells in the presence of so many different people, so many different backgrounds and different perspectives and ways of life, uh, different identities, different things about themselves. Uh, and, and he tells this, this parable. And, and of course, here we are, thousands of years later from the moment of Jesus telling it, and, and we see this, and we're reminded of the immense love that God has for us, right? We're reminded of the immense love that is illustrated, right, in the Father. Because we know after hearing this parable many a times, or perhaps it's your first time, what a privilege it is for me to share with you, that this, this Father in the story displays, it, 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 he represents God who is in heaven chasing after people. Who doesn't come to people with, with vengeance, but he comes to them with, with grace and love to embrace, to embrace them. That, that is what the image of the, of the Father represents in this story. And, and we know that. And when we read it, when we talk about it, when we sing songs about it, all oh, our hearts are so excited. But yet we fall short of some greater layers that Jesus is trying to get us to understand. Because we often approach this parable from the perspective of how the father approaches his kids. But we never talk about how his two sons approach him. And that's where we really begin to step into this third shift that Jesus is trying to bring out within us. This third shift called slave to child. Make sure you write that on your notes. This third shift of slave to child. Because both of the sons have a lot more in common than we think. What's beautiful is that both of them also resemble people. Just as the father in the story resembles God who's in heaven, the two sons also resemble people. The younger son, the one who left, the one who walked away, reminds us of individuals, maybe even ourselves, those who maybe grown up a little bit in church, who've been around God, some who've been exposed to a little bit of this, this Jesus Christian stuff, 
But a little bit through our days, we've gotten to a point where, you know what, I just kind of want to do my thing. I, I just want to go my own route. I want to go my, I really want to go have fun and do all these things. I'm tired of, of hearing all this no stuff and all these rules. And so I'm going to go do things my way. And just as the younger son in the story runs off and chases after all of his, all that his heart can desire, so do we run out for all that we can find. We try to find great wealth and successful careers. We try to find belonging and having a, fair, a family and having a husband or a wife, trying to have a, a kids, right? Trying to come up with some kind of dream of our own, trying to do something that we aspire to do. We chase after so many things. And even along the way, maybe we try a few things that God really tells us not to get into. But just as the younger son wound up on the other side of his story, realizing that the advertisements of the world don't live up to what is shown, we too find ourselves in a place of feeling pretty broken and empty. And so like the other son, getting his own job, trying to be responsible and do his thing, we try to help ourselves a little bit. We try to value family more, try to be a little bit better of a husband. We try to love our kids a little bit more. We, we try, but then we just can't seem to get it right. And then at some point we, we decide, you know what, maybe, maybe I'll go back to church. Maybe I'll, I'll try to, to be a good Christian again. And maybe through our whole life, we never really stopped believing in God, but we certainly didn't want anything to do with him. And so just as the younger son runs to his dad full of guilt and shame and says, listen, I'll just serve you. I'll, I'll be a servant. I will work for your approval. I, I will work and try to earn my place in your business. We run to God and say, you know what, Lord, I, I'm so sorry. I'm, I'm going to try to make it up to you. I'm going to try to earn my way back to you. I'm going to try to get myself doing all the right things. I'm going to try to get everything in order. I'm going to try to be better. I'm going to try to do good. I'm going to try to earn your appreciation. And even though the older brother never left home, he was a lot like his younger younger brother. And the same is true for many of us who resemble the older brother in a sense that we too walk through life always believing, always having a bumper sticker on. Maybe we're in and out of church a little bit. But we feel like in the seasons when we're trying to do right by God, we ought to be rewarded. We walk into church hoping that if we check this off, maybe God will reward us this week. Maybe we'll get a little bit of blessing in our life. Maybe some good things will come our way, finally. Maybe things will be different if we just start putting this mask on. And just as the older brother became angry at his dad, saying, where's my reward for being faithful? Where's my reward? Where's the good things in my life for never walking away? Many of us who resemble the older brother become angry at God. Because we never really were unfaithful. At least we don't think. We never really did wrong. At least we don't think. And so we come into this moment, being angry at God, saying, God, why is my family, why is my marriage still all the same? Why is all this stuff still the same? Why don't I feel you like, like I thought I would? And, and that's the tension of this shift from slave to child. Because both of the brothers, as they approached God, as they approached their father, they both approached him with a heart of just wanting to be good enough, trying to earn their way, trying to show they deserve him, at least for the older brother, trying to prove their worth, trying to build up their own life. 
And Jesus tries to draw this, this reality in front of us. That while one of them was the prodigal son who left and came back, both of the sons were resistant to go into the house. The first one was resistant because he was full of shame and guilt and said, I don't deserve it. I'm just going to try to earn my way. The other one was full of anger and bitterness and says, where's my reward? I thought I, I, thought I did what you asked. And so often we fall short of the doorstep that God is inviting us to when we hear these words of, of relationship. We hear these words of love. We hear these words of, of friendship with God. And, and they fall on deaf ears because we are so confined to what it means to try to be good enough, to try to earn God's appreciation, to try to work ourselves up to, to, to being worthy enough. And so we fall into this trap of being a slave of measuring ourselves by all of these rules that many of us put on ourselves that maybe perhaps God hasn't even put on us. We are hesitant, especially for many of us who resemble the younger brother, to even come back to God because having grown up in church, we have this image of what the expectations are. We've got to stop doing drugs. We've got to stop looking at pornography. We've got to stop talking this way. We've got to stop gossiping. We've got to stop all of these things. And so we have this expectation of what it looks like to be in a relationship with God, but we still have an expectation of a slave to a master, not a child to their dad. Are you, are you following me, church? And so, so many of us, miss what it's like to walk in relationship with God because we're confined to a sense of slavery in spiritual speaking with him. Because Jesus later on, a couple chapters later, in Luke chapter 18, he finds himself in another moment with the religious leaders, with all the people who were there before, are now there again. And as he's speaking some more, he, he says these words. He, he says this in Luke 18, verse 17. As he's got everyone's ears turned his way, he says, listen, truly I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. Truly I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. If you're a nerd like me, you'll notice that this is one of the very few times that Jesus ever says anything in the negative. A lot of the times he says, do this and this will happen, right? Do this and you'll enter the kingdom of heaven, all this stuff, right? He says a lot of things in the positive, but for in a very few moments, this is one of them. He says, don't do this and you'll never this. He draws a very cold, serious line right down the middle of the room. And he says, if you don't come to God like a little child, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven, in a sense of being all of who God is. When we read the Gospels, when we read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we hear these words like kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God. And these were phrases that people used at that time in the world to illustrate all of who God is. When they talk about the kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God was the presence of God, being with God, belonging to God as one of his people. And so we can't really find belonging in Christ if we don't come to him like a little child. You know what he means by that? Yeah. He means with a great, sincere sense of humility and gratitude. When he says walking with him, he says being like a little child is having a heart of humility and a heart of gratitude. Humility. Having an honest view of who we are in the eyes of God. Whether the older brother, little brother, you're not up here in the clouds and you're also not dirt. <laughs> you're here. You're not as far away as you think you are. You're not as good as you think you are. You're kind of here. 
Humility washes away the pride that makes us the older brother. Humility also washes away the pride that keeps us from running back home like the little brother. Because we try to put pride in working at the local farm and feeding the pigs just like the little brother, doing our thing. We're going to read some more self-help books. We're going to try to do what we think is best. We're going to try to do this. We're going to try to do this because we really don't want to run back home. We don't want to bring our shame to God or our guilt to Him. Humility reminds us that we always need Jesus. Humility reminds us that as we progress through our days, that we need Him more and more and more. That as we wake up every morning, we wake up with a heart that says, Oh God, I need you today. There's a song I've been listening to a lot lately that I'd never heard my whole life. Having, being an individual who never grew up in church, coming to Christ when I was in high school. I heard this song and I fell in love with it. This song that goes like this, it says, when I rise, no, it goes uh, in the morning, when I rise, in the morning, when I rise, in the morning, when I rise, what does it say? Give me Jesus. Later on, when I am alone, give me Jesus. And when I come to die, give me Jesus. I know what you're thinking. Maybe I'll try for American Idol next year. But how often do we begin our days of saying, Jesus, I really need you. I really need you today. How often for many of us who feel like we've been walking with God for a while, find warmth again in his presence. How many of us feel like we've been to church for a long time, been doing what we think is right, we've been checking off all the boxes, right? We've been doing our best to keep up with God and to prove ourselves. How often do we find ourselves in a place of saying, Jesus, I, I, I really need you today. I really need you. It reminds me of the song Amazing Grace when that line comes of the sweetness of the first hour I first believed. Remember that? And maybe I butchered, butchered that whole verse, but the sweetness of, of, of God's grace, the hour I first believed. Humility reminds us that we only have life if Christ is in us and that if we are in Him and that we need Him. And gratitude, being like a child, gratitude keeps us in great appreciation for how our God loves us. This last week, I took Mason to his dentist appointment, our son, three years old, and he did wonderful. We were going throughout the whole dentist office, right? And he was walking around like a little boy. He knew right where to go. He sat in the chair, was amazing the whole time. And all the ladies, they were like, you're like a little man. And I'm like, no, he's a little boy, right? He's my little boy. He's not grown up this fast, right? He's not a little man yet. But we're there, he's behaving so well. So afterwards, like, all right, we're gonna go get some ice cream, right? Which, if you know me, really, I just wanted some ice cream. So we went and got some ice cream and, uh, Ran over McDonald's and we got some dollar Sundays, right? And picked him up from the counter and I right, Mason, you stay right there at the booth, I'll grab him. So I came back and I was walking to the table. He saw these cheap, basic Sundays, right? With a little bit of hot fudge on them. And you would have thought I was bringing him a horse or a, 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 a zebra or some giant animal that he loves from Africa. Because his face lit up and was like, Daddy, thank you. Oh, I love you. I was like, I'm going to bring you ice cream every day, buddy, just like so hear that. For some reason, especially for many of us who resemble the older brother, it's like, God, I, I've been faithful for a while. I feel like I've earned more. 
I've prayed a lot. I've read the Bible a lot. I've been to church a lot. God, I feel like I've had some more blessings in my life. I feel like I want to have this health issue. I feel like my kids want to be a mess. I feel like my marriage would be okay. God, I, I feel like things would be better, but, but what is going on? For many of us who resemble the younger brother, we think, God, why have you walked away from me? We forget how God is, is with us. We forget how God doesn't forget about us, even when we've forgotten about him. We don't want to be people of great gratitude towards God. Whether he hands us a dollar Sunday with a little bit of hot fudge or hands us a horse or a zebra or whatever it is, just you pick, right? We don't know how to be people anymore who sit in the presence of God and be like, wow, I can't believe I know you. I mean, have you done that lately? Wow, God, I, I can't believe that I know you. I, I can't believe that I live in a country where I get to read this and, and no one's coming to arrest me. And then I can read and read and I can fall in love with you and I can memorize this and I can know your heart and I can know your voice. Oh, Lord, thank you that I get to know you today. We're people who are not humble in the presence of our God and we are not grateful and therefore we've stayed as slaves and we have not entered into what it's like to be a child of God. Like the two brothers, one who was on his knees in the mud saying, I'm, I'm not good enough. I'll never earn it. I just, I'm just going to try to work my way up who stays out in the yard. And like the older brother who stays out in the field, angry and bitter, refusing to go in. We find ourselves on the outside of what God is inviting us to. And so many things around this shift of slave to child are keeping us there. And Jesus says, listen, if you have a heart of a little child, come right in. Because that's who our God is. All the, all the ideas of, that we, we plaster on God, all the things that we think about Him, we will always believe. If we refuse to have a heart like a little child, all the things we think about God that are not true, we will always have in our heart if we do not change the condition of our heart. And the opposite is true. We will know what it's like to really know him. To know what it's really like. To hear him tell us that we're loved. And the insecurities, they go away. We'll really know what it's like when he tells us we're forgiven. And the skeletons of our closet are, are gone not swept under the rug, but they're gone. The shame that we carry into church and into so much of our life is gone. The regret that we see in the mirror is gone. The lies that we believe about who we are are gone. When we make this shift, We make the shift and decide, you know what, I'm going to start being more like a child longing to spend time with his dad. Mason and I loved getting Sundays that day, having fudge on his cheeks and on his nose, loving ice cream. He's so much like me. I love it. Spending time playing in the booth playing games and talking and even though he's talking gibberish I have no idea what he's saying but still enjoying the warmth of the moment of just being together God is inviting us to that 
to put aside all this junk, all these knots in our shoelaces, just set it all aside and know what it's like to really be a child of God.